Hey everyone, welcome back to Policy Punchline. Here at the show, we interview scholars, policymakers, and business executives about some of the most urgent issues and frontier ideas in our world today. I'm Princeton senior Tiger Gao. Uh, today, we continue our aspiring intellectuals coverage where we have longer and harder conversations and more foundational topics with our guests, mostly about the research uh, from quantum computing to bioengineering, from environmental ethics to human psychology. Uh, I'm very excited about this interview today. The following conversation is with Esteban Rossi Hansberg. He is the Theodore A. Wells Professor of Economics at Prince University. Professor Rossi Hansberg is a leader in the field of macroeconomics, international trade, and urban and regional economics. He has spent the past 16 years at Princeton and has recently been appointed the Glenn A. Lloyd Distinguished Service Professor at the University of Chicago, where he would join the faculty of U Chicago's economics department in the summer of 2021. I've always really wanted to interview Professor Rossi Heinsberg as he is a pioneer in what is known as spatial economics. We will soon dive into this topic in this interview. Um, but to quickly tell you the tension here, research in macroeconomics has traditionally really emphasized aggregate disturbances and aggregate outcomes as a source of explaining aggregate changes. Professor Rossi Hansberg hopes to zoom in on more what we call the disaggregated impacts on individual agents, firms, and how that may translate into aggregate macro impacts. And in this interview, we will mainly talk about his most recent research in climate economics, where he incorporates human behaviors and individual level impacts into previous models of understanding global warming. Spatial economics as a, as a field is quite foreign to undergraduate students and the general public. Uh, we're much more familiar with macro policy debates such as is inflation coming? Uh, is the stimulus package after COVID-19 big enough? And it's much harder uh, to piece together Asians and firms, migration, trade, investment, productivity, welfare, carbon cycle, nativity, all those fascinating concepts all together. And that is what's so powerful uh, of the research by Professor Rossi Hansberg. And that is also the reason uh, why we really spent 90 minutes diving into this one paper that he recently uh, accomplished. Uh, it's also quite funny that both of us showed up in the interview in beige sweaters uh, that is not planned. Uh, as he would call this, this is where the fashion is today. So I suppose uh, both of us are at the frontier of of fashion, and, and he is certainly at the frontier of economics research. I'm very excited to present you this interview, and it's also, I guess, a sad moment for Princeton's economics community, as Professor Rossi Hansberg will soon depart and join a University of Chicago's department. Uh, we also talk about that decision that he made, and he encourages students to think about economics academia and his own journey studying economics. Uh, I really hope you enjoy this conversation. And this is my conversation with Professor Esteban Rossi Hansberg. Professor Rossi Hansberg, thank you so much for joining me today. And uh, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, maybe we can start by uh, uh, having some uh, very general, big introductory questions. Uh, as I just mentioned to you before our interview, many of the undergraduate population, especially in economics, don't really interact with a lot of the work you do, especially because I feel like macro, a lot of modeling, a lot of math, uh, the barriers to, to entry seems to be slightly higher for a lot of the undergraduate students. So would you mind telling, I guess, the, the, to a layman, to the general population, uh, what, what, what do you do as, as a researcher and what are some of the topics that interest you? Yes. So, uh, I mean, I do a kind of a relatively large uh, or the scope of my research is relatively broad, but uh, one, I guess, core aspect of it is uh, what you could refer to as uh, spatial economics, and that is bringing space into the thinking about economic issues. And so uh, in some topics like, say, uh, international trade, this has you know, traditionally been the case because, of course, you know, trade is the international trade kind of by definition is across countries and countries obviously are uh, distinct in terms of location. But uh, you can also bring space to thinking about all sorts of other issues like migration. You can obviously think about space in terms of the diffusion of technology. You can think about space in the context of innovation and where that innovation is happening and how the distribution of economic activity uh, matters for where and how innovation happens and the extent of, of that innovation. And so it connects with issues uh, related to growth and development. Um, 
And uh, lately, I've been also uh, working a lot on um, climate change and kind of the effect that um, trying to evaluate uh, the impact that changes in climate are going to have on the world economy, uh, emphasizing the fact that those effects are going to be heterogeneous in space, and therefore, you know, thinking about it from this kind of spatial perspective uh, is important. And so, you know, space has been kind of one of the key topics that I work with, uh, and and then, you know, from there, I've done other types of work also in terms of firm organization and thinking a bit a bit about how firms. Uh, do um, their production process because it exactly links to the type of workers that they hire, where are they, whether they go on to set different plants in different places, different countries, and so that links with issues about offshoring, uh, et cetera. So, you know, it's a broad, uh, broad variety of, of, of things, but uh, it's all connected in some way through this notion of space and the importance of space when thinking about economic issues. Uh, you mentioned the, the phrase uh, spatial economics. Could one interpret that as a, a new sub-vertical in macroeconomics or more of an interdis interdisciplinary concept that is connecting multi-disciplines together? How, how should we think of spatial economics placement over uh, multiple uh, disciplines and verticals in economics? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a good question. I, I, I think like, you know, I mean, the, 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 the borders between what's microeconomics and what's macroeconomics uh, are traditionally, I mean, we're traditionally very clearly defined and progressively they've become more and more fussy. And one of the reasons for that is that there was a revolution in economics that uh, were, macroeconomics that was traditionally or had traditionally been done uh, by postulating aggregate relationships and and these aggregate relation and kind of that had some empirical content but uh, that were used to think about the aggregate economy um, the kind of the way to do microeconomics changed from that to um, and a way of doing macroeconomics by explicit aggregation, by modeling the behavior of individual agents, individual people, individual firms, and aggregating explicitly from those agents into the aggregate economy in order to get uh, you know, aggregate implications. And so uh, once you do that, once you think about individual agents, their decision process, and aggregate explicitly from those agents, then of course, you know, to do macro, we also need to do micro. We also need to understand the behavior of these agents and kind of how they're making choices, how they interact with, with each other, et cetera, uh, because that forms the basis of those aggregate models. And so, you know, by now we, I mean, you may work a little bit more on the, on the upper part of that problem or the, or the lower part of that problem. But at the end of the day, uh, the problem itself it's all integrating. It's all part of the same big problem of how the economy um, behaves and what's the, and the behavior of these individual units, which are agents and firms in particular, right? Now, now spatial economics uh, comes into that by saying, well, there's a, this other key dimension of heterogeneity, right? That is not people are different. It's not only that goods are different or services are different, but it, there's also another dimension, which is that, you know, those things happen in different places, right? And that locations are different. And that if you're, you know, and, and so once you recognize that, that other form of heterogeneity of differences, uh, then, you know, that affects that explicit aggregation because it affects, you know, depending on where people are, they, they may interact more with each other or less. Um, and so once you do that explicit aggregation, of course, whether you take into account that uh, spatial dimension or not matters. And so I think one way to think about it is that spatial economics tries to you know, bring that other dimension of heterogeneity and then interact right there in that explicit aggregation and kind of contribute to, to, to making that explicit aggregation from individual behavior 
to macroeconomic behavior more precise, more uh, uh, more richer, you know, by adding the spatial dimension. And so, you know, it's right there in between micro and macro, I guess. Uh, that's the short answer. Uh, it, it seems that, as you said, the trend of economics these days is people coming together and focus on the same problem rather than saying the micro people do micro problems and macro people do macro problems. And there's this emphasis on behavior on the micro foundation. So may, maybe I think a good way to uh, contextualize a lot of this is through your cl recent climate change research, because you really made some uh, very wonderful improvements on a lot of the models that, that previously did not consider the behavioral changes of agents, didn't bring all those elements together. So uh, th this paper, the economic geography of global warming, maybe we could start with this paper where uh, you, you seek to sort of evaluate the economic consequences of global warming using a very dynamic model, but not just any dynamic model, as people say in macroeconomics, but really try to bring out these different foundations and connecting those different dots. So uh, would you mind telling us a little bit more about this paper? Right. So uh, so, th so, what that paper does is it, it tries to provide a new framework to think about the impact that global warming, in particular, the increase in temperatures in the world, um, are going to have like what's the economic Im impact of it and quantify that economic impact and specifically also think about how those economic impacts are going to be um, different across uh, locations are going to vary across different locations of the world and so how different places and people living in different places are going to be affected by this phenomenon today and in the future so and the and the the main the main contribution is uh, you know connecting with what we were just saying in terms of micro foundations incorporating micro foundations uh, and a lot of the integrated assessment models out there for example that the uh, IPCC uh, has proposed etc what they do is uh, the economic component of those models uh, essentially maps um, the level of temperatures in the world and maybe some moments of the distribution of temperatures in the world and maybe other climate variables into um, levels of output, of aggregate output. And, and so, you know, and then there may be feed, feedback processes by which, you know, if you produce more, you emit more carbon as a result of that, then there's a carbon cycle that in turn affects temperatures uh, and that kind of feeds back into through that function into output itself, right? And so it's integrated in the sense that it has like a climate uh, module that is this that carbon cycle, and then it has like an economic module that is this mapping between uh, temperature or other cl climate variables and output. Where we come in is we say, well, then you know that kind of relationship between temperature, say to be specific. And output, you know, it's actually formed out of uh, again agents uh, that are in, in, in firms that are living in different parts of the world, uh, and that they're going to be affected by this phenomenon in very different ways depending on where they are. And not only that, but as a result of whatever happens in the world, they're going to react to it, and they're going to they're going to change their behavior because of what they are experimenting. For example, you know, if you live in an area, I mean, like the most basic example, I guess, is if you live in an area that is gonna be flooded, right? As a result of the sea level rise, then you're gonna move out of that area, right? And, and so you're gonna move somewhere else. And, and so in order to understand what's the effect of um, coastal flooding, we, we need to understand, well, that you're gonna move and where are you gonna move and what's kind of the, the effect that you're going to have in the economy wherever you move. And so uh, what we want to do in this paper the, on, on global warming is essentially bring in that uh, machinery, that spatial uh, economics machinery, and distinguish between different locations of the, in the world uh, and think about the effect that climate is going to have on the different locations of the in the world, and then on the behavior of agents in those different locations, and then kind of aggregate that behavior explicitly, right? Uh, so do that explicit aggregation that we were talking about, for, but recognizing that those effects are going to be heterogeneous; they're going to be different across uh, locations, and so that's kind of our emphasis. And and you know, 
And this partly the reason this hasn't been done is because it's a it's a complex problem, right? It's a complex problem because you know if you want to have a lot of uh, spatial detail, then it's also then I mean just to just to give you a sense of the the magnitudes that we're talking about. The, we are quantifying this type of model. So that is wh whenever we bring those models to the data, we're, we, the way we're doing it is by essentially putting a, a grid on the, on the world. And this grid is of one degree by one degree. So that means in the equator, that's about 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers. Uh, so that's the squares. That's the, that's the kind of resolution, if you will, of the analysis, right? And then, and so that means that you have about what about 23,000 squares that have some land in it where there's there there can be some economic activity and then think about that over time right so 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 those different squares are going to be affected differently there's people living there there's firms producing there and people are going to have the chance to move away from those places but you know it's a costly thing if you move so so you have to pay the cost of doing that they can trade across them they, they we want to link them in kind of economic relevant ways Right to take into account how they're going to be affected and the ways in which people in those places or the ways that the people in those places have or the, 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 the mechanisms that they have in order to uh, adjust, adapt to this phenomena. OK, and so what that means is that and so and, and so there's three key adaptation mechanisms in this work. The, the, the first one is migration. So whenever something, if temperatures rise and you live in, uh, in an area that is very warm and temperatures rise even further, there's two reasons that you don't like that. Well, that may affect the, the, you know, the quality of life there. It's warmer. Uh, and so what we call amenities, which is like a summary statistic for um, how much you like to live in that particular location, Right, those are going to go down, and then you know the productivity of the place, which is you know again like a summary statistic of uh, how good it is to produce in that place, how 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 productive firms are in that location. Uh, that's also going to go down. So and so, what does that do? Well, you you obviously don't like that, and so as a result of that, you have different options. So one option is you can say, well let me move, move to some other place. And so migration is clearly an adaptation mechanism. Another one is to say, well, maybe temperature affects my production, but I can trade with other locations. And as a result of that trade, that can um, uh, lower some of the impact of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the phenomenon of, of, of climate change or global warming. And then the, the third key adaptation mechanism is uh, investment. So when, and, and, and I think this is very important because a lot of the analysis uh, that is done on this issue is based on, uh, is based on the idea of the world or, or, or starting from the position that the world is as it is and is never gonna change, right? And so, and so you know, economic activity is where it is and so, you know, it's very costly then to, of course, affect uh, certain areas because that's where economic activity is. And there's no way that we can ever, you know, move things somewhere else, right? And so if I can never move in, if I can never make uh, economic activity in, um, in Siberia more productive, say, right? Then of course, the option of moving to Siberia is a lousy option because you know productivity is low there, and so you know if you did, if if something happens to the places that are most productive today, you know that's not really an alternative or is a is a is a bad alternative, and so the losses are going to be very large. But once we are talking over hundred, say hundred years, right? Then of course you can develop the cities in Siberia and make them much better by investing in them, et cetera. If that becomes a priority for the world, right? And capital flows into those places, et cetera, right? Because temperatures now are higher, then of course uh, you can develop them as well, right? So, so, so that, that option exists there, particularly when we're talking about a phenomenon that is so protracted, namely that it happens, you know, relatively slowly over many, many years, right? And so, 
So that means that, you know, if you think about the economy 100 years ago, it's a very different economy than the economy today. And in another 100 years, it's going to be a different economy too. So we have a chance also to invest in other locations, right? And so that's another important adaptation mechanism. And so the idea is bringing all those uh, different types of adaptation mechanisms together and analyze what's the impact of uh, global temperatures. Now, of course, you know, depending on where people are, they're going to produce, they're going to emit carbon that's going to feed back into, um, that's going to go into the atmosphere. It's going to, through, you know, a standard carbon cycle, affect global temperatures, which then are going to affect local temperatures. And so you have the whole uh, process of, um, you know, how economic activity affects the carbon stocks the temperatures, local temperatures, and then economic activity, right? And so you can then think about how that process evolves over time and how it affects uh, the different locations, depending on the severity of, of, um, of climate change, depending on different policies that you put in place, et cetera. And so that's the, what the, this paper is about. It's trying, it's, 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 it's doing that, proposing such a model, quantifying it, and then uh, starting what's going to be uh, the impact of climate change and, and, and what could be the impact of some of the policies that people have proposed. That's a wonderful introduction and overview to the paper. And I can already uh, sense how complex it must be to, to piece all those puzzles together. But I guess just to kind of take things apart a little bit and really try to understand the nitty gritty of the model, maybe we can start with the first two concepts that you mentioned, em amenities uh, and, and productivity. Uh, or and pe people might say welfare and productivity, and, and we often say uh, welfare gain, welfare, welfare loss. How do you measure welfare and productivity in those contexts? Okay, so first of all, let me make a distinction between welfare, right? So and um, and amenities. So different concepts in the, in the following sense: welfare, or the, the way we think about welfare, is the level of uh, utility or the level of um, uh, how much individuals get out of an, a particular situation. And that welfare, right, is formed out of, uh, or in these models is formed, I mean, you can specify it in different ways, but, it, but the way we specify is formed out of a number of things. One of which is consumption. So you consume a variety of goods, right? And so using your income, you buy these goods, and then you consume them. And so that's the part of, uh, of, of the things that you like, and therefore go into your welfare, right? But there's another part, which is that how much you enjoy the place where you are. For example, if you live in a place where um, temperatures are super high, you may be miserable. And so, you know, you, you may still be there because uh, you earn a very high wage, but, but you may not like it that much. And so that affects your welfare. So amenities, which is how much, how nice it is to live there, what's, how pleasant it is to live there, you know, affect your welfare, are a part of your welfare, but, but it's only a part of your welfare. There's also this consumption piece, right? And then you can put other things there. For example, you can put a uh, idiosyncratic preferences for location. So you may, you know, like to live in the place where you were born or where your family is or where you have like a cultural attachment to, etc. And so, you know, we can think about idiosyncratic preferences for individual locations, and those would be captured also on kind of the amenity component of a, of a particular location for a particular individual. Right. So, so amenities are in general defined that, like that. And then there is the consumption piece. Right. Now, one of the key, I mean, there's, the, there's this uh, set of uh, models that have been, uh, you know, grouped under the, the concept of quantitative spatial economics, which is, which is, a, which is essentially the types of models that I've been describing here. And, uh, and one of the things that these models do is uh, they propose a, a, a way of reading from the data or identifying from the data uh, these amenities and productivity levels, right? So they're gonna, so, they, they, so the models postulate that amenities and productivities can vary by location, right? 
And then think, and then they uh, say, well, conditional on what those amenities and productivities are, people are gonna make decisions of where they wanna be, et cetera, right? And, and they're gonna produce and they're gonna earn a wage uh, in the different locations that is potentially different in the different locations, right? And they have the opportunity, like I said, to migrate across locations. And so if you think about it like this, then that model then is gonna generate a distribution of people in space, right? So how many people live where, right? And a distribution of income in space, right? So I can go, and so that's that's like a mapping. If you think about it, like a, a mapping is like a mapping from amenities and productivity to uh, population and income, right? At the local level. And now suppose I, 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 I invert that, I, I, I go the, in the other direction, right? I can say, well, suppose I have income and I have population, can I go back and recover those amenities and those productivities? And in many cases, these models, sometimes you can prove it, depends on the character, exact characteristic of the model, you can actually do that inversion, right? And obtain a unique set of amenities and productivities conditional on population and income. And so if you give me data on population and income, I can use the model, invert the model and obtain those amenities and productivities. And so that gives them back to me, right? And so that identifies them. And now I have them. I know how much people like to live in a particular place and how productive they are if they are in that particular place. And how am I identifying that? Think about it like this. If I, if I look at the, uh, if there's some location where there's a lot of people, right? But income is not that high, real income is not that high, right? There must be some other reason. Why are they there, right? So it has to be that that location is nice, right? Otherwise, people wouldn't want to be there, right? Uh, and, but, and vice versa. If I see a location that is, you know, has this really high real wage, but but no one wants to go there. Well, it must be that there's, you know, some problem with, with that location. And so whatever that is, right? And we can think about exactly what the source of it is, but whatever that is, that's gonna be captured in this concept of amenities, right? So it's, it's in some sense, this, this is by um, revealed preference, right? In the sense of, you know, by the location of these agents, they reveal, right? How much or not they like, the different locations uh, through the through the the, the the structure the structure of the model. Now there's some like this logic that I described. Now it's not exactly precise, and the reason it's not exactly precise is that you know one of the reasons why there may be a lot of people in one location, even though incomes are low, say in my example, right, is because um, is because they are trapped. For, so for example, suppose it's really costly to get out. Right, because migration costs out of that place are really high. Right, then that they could be they could be there, and and I I would misinterpret the fact that there's lots of people there, even though incomes are low, as high amenities. And so I also need to take into account the fact that there's migration costs. But migration costs also imply tell me something about the flows. So by looking at trying to match also the flows over time. I can obtain migration costs and then I obtain all three things rather than just the amenities and productivity. So at the end of the day, uh, I can recover from observed data and cha changes in population, levels of population, levels of income, migration costs, uh, amenities, and productivity. Okay. And so, I, they, so is this kind of, so at the end of the day, is this kind of revealed preference concept that explains exactly according to the model, how much people earn and where do they locate in the data, I see. right? Yeah. So the model rationalizes, in that sense, the model is flexible enough to rationalize the data exactly. So the, in the baseline year, in some sense, the model by construction exactly matches the, the distribution of population and the distribution of income. Uh, would you mind helping us visualize the, your model a little bit? I imagine it must be a very complex computer program. And uh, you mentioned three key ad adaptation mechanisms. 
migration, trade, and investments, but you also have many other components in your model, including uh, people's repro reproductive behaviors, and you, have, you also mentioned a carbon cycle. So I imagine there must be all kinds of equations and variables, and you link each other, and you also mentioned distribution. So you must have all kinds of distributions of data. So uh, how, how do you link all these things together? Right. So at the end of the day, um, so, so there's, you know, as in as as you normally have in 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 economic models, in equilibrium economic models, you have agents. These agents have preferences, and these preferences, which determine the, their welfare, right? Like I said, depend on their consumption, their uh, how much they like the different locations, um, and potentially the the cost of migrating to different places, right? And so these agents are gonna make decisions, right? And they they understand uh, what those amenities are, but those amenities in turn uh, are um, affected by temperature, right? So by their local temperature of where they live is affects those amenities, how much they enjoy a particular place. And so they're gonna make decisions on how much to consume based on the income that they earn in that location, right? Which in turn depends on the productivity of firms in that location, which depends on uh, temperature as well, right? Now these firms are gonna hire these workers, right? And they're gonna make a, a bunch of decisions. They're gonna hire workers. They're gonna uh, use some uh, energy or electricity and, um, that in turn is going to be produced using either clean energy or fossil fuels. And then, um, so, so energy is an input in their production. And so the more they produce, the more energy they're going to want to use. And, uh, and then depending on the local price of uh, fossil fuels versus vis-a-vis -vis clean energy, uh, whoever is supplying or the firm that is supplying uh, uh, energy uh, is going to use a particular combination of fossil fuels and clean energy. And the to, to the extent that they use fossil fuels, they're going to emit carbon into the atmosphere, right? Now, once we uh, understand how much carbon is being emitted to the atmosphere at the local level in each one of those locations through the decisions of these firms, uh, then we know from the scientific literature, right? We can borrow that completely, that component completely from the scientific literature, how that then, uh, what's the extent to which that stays in the atmosphere? I mean, there's a, there's a set of, the, what I call the carbon cycle is a set of equations that take you from those emissions and uh, uh, to the accumulation of carbon in the atmosphere and then to temperature changes as a result of that accumulation of carbon in the, in the atmosphere. So that's the carbon cycle. And so that gives us this aggregate stock of carbon, right? Or uh, this level of carbon, which, you know, it has some complexity in the sense that some of it is absorbed by seas, et cetera, right? So there's a, there's a, there's a whole, uh, there's a whole uh, set of uh, sort of issues that go into that model. But like I said, we're essentially borrowing that from the scientists and then uh, in particular from the IPCC 2013 report. And, uh, and, then, uh, and then, you know, one of the interesting things about, and, and, and tragic things, I guess, about climate change is that no matter where this carbon is emitted, right, it's almost, it's very quick in mixing into the atmosphere and affecting global temperatures, right? It's, 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 it's a global externality in that sense, very clearly a global externality in the sense that, you know, you're not affected by your own carbon emissions. That's, it's really only the, the aggregate that, that matters. But what is not like that is that once that carbon uh, affects, you know, that total stock of carbon is affected, that affects global temperatures, which in turn, it maps down into local temperatures to some, uh, what, what's called a down, downscaling. And so there's, 
you know, potentially very complex models of downscaling, how those global temperatures trans transform into local temperatures. But, um, but you know, we, we, we use a particular, a particular approximation by Mitchell that is kind of a linear approximation. So changes in aggregate, you know, affect local temperatures through some local uh, coefficient and that local coefficient depends on all sorts of local characteristics, like you know how close you are to the coast, albedo, that type of thing. But um, at the end of the, the day, uh, you have this kind of local component, and 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 that affects that that creates the effect on local temperatures. And that local component, um, you know, it's very different across locations. So that's a, another important thing to realize. So like a one degree uh, Celsius increase in global temperatures, right? May have, may actually increase temperatures in some locations by about by half a degree, and in some others by two degrees. And so, in, in general, as you go to the poles, the effect is larger. So, bigger changes in temper local temperatures for a given change in global temperature, right? So, so uh, so you have very heterogeneous effects there. But then, anyway, but but you affect the lo the local temperatures, and then the other effect on local temperature in turn affects these amenities and this uh, productivity that we were talking about. And that kind of closes the cycle, right? Because that, that's where we started with the decisions of these agents, okay? And so, and so the only component that I missed in that description is then the fact that when firms are making their production decisions, they're hiring the workers, they're using some local land, they're using energy, they're also deciding the extent to which they wanna invest, right? In improving the local technology. And, 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 and the interesting thing about investment is that, you know, think about uh, innovation, right? When you innovate, one of the, you know, beautiful things about innovation is that you, you think about something, you invent it, but once you invent it, you can replicate, you can use that idea many times, right? And so the, 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 the whole point of having a new technology, the whole beauty of having a new technology is that you can scale it up. Right, and in, in some sense, the whole process of modern production has been ways to scale up a particular technology, right? Like that Ford and the assembly line, or uh, Starbucks and you know um, and the, the the formula to sell coffee um, at the local level, right? But 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 whatever the technology, key part of the modern production is you know replication, right? And so. And, and, and the extent to which you can replicate depends on your, um, your market size. And so who do you sell to, right? So I'm gonna have more incentives to innovate if I have a big market size, if there's lots of people uh, around me, if I'm in a very dense location, if you know selling to others is cheap because I'm in a very central location or, or, or the transport network in my location is very good, uh, so if I'm relatively close to where customers are in my location, but everywhere else in the world, then I have more incentives to innovate, right? Because my market size is larger. And the key thing about innovation is that I, I pay to, to, to create that innovation, but then I want to replicate it as many times as possible, right? So the more I can replicate it, the more, pro the more profitable it is to invest in innovation. And so market size is a, is a, is an essential component of that, right? And, and 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 so that's where trade comes in, right? If trade is very cheap, that increases my market size because I can reach more locations in the world, right? And so cheaply, and so that means that there's more incentives to to innovate. So so the trade network is an an, an essential component for that. And so firms are gonna be designing that. And so that's why in some sense in the model today, there's not that much investment in Siberia because there's not that many people there. It's kind of, if you start producing there, it's hard to reach other people in the world, the trade. And so, you know, firms don't wanna go there and you know, innovate there, right? But they do wanna innovate in New York because there's lots of customers close by, the whole Northeast is there, you know, in, in there's easy communication with Europe. And so that there you do want to do it, right? So, but but think now about an economy in which, you know, produ production is kind of slowly shifting north and more shifting into those locations. Well, that process is going to start operating there, right? And so it's going to start, innovation is going to st uh, start happening. 
and that's going to increase productivity in those locations. And when we're talking, talking about one thing, important thing is when you think about innovation, don't think about, I mean, you know, the light bulb or something, right? I mean, it's, uh, you know, obviously that's innovation too, right? And that's in some sense the, the greatest innovation, of course. But, uh, but, but there's a lot of much more trivial local innovation, right? In little improvements in the way people do things, et cetera, that also affect productivity and also affect, uh, affect you know, incomes in, uh, at the local level, but are not you know, revolutionary at, at that level. But that other type of innovation, that more, more uh, routine, more common form of in innovation, more mundane form of innovation, uh, is happening all the time. And it's an essential source of um, productivity growth in the economy, right? And so, and so that that uh, that is there too. And so, you know, at the end of the day, that all seems uh, complex. You can all summarize it. I mean, just to to get back to your original question, you can all summarize it uh, in a bunch of nonlinear equations. Uh, and so, at the end of the day, solving such a model uh, results in solving. Uh, a system of nonlinear differential equation, um, nonlinear uh, equations, and so that uh, not differential, so just a system of nonlinear <laughs> equations, and uh, and so and, and essentially solving it for for all the periods in which you're running the model, and so the computational aspect of this is: can you solve that big system of uh, of nonlinear equations in an efficient way, right? And so. And so for that, the system needs to have some properties, et cetera. And so part of the, the, the work that goes into, into to, you know, deriving a model like this and proposing a model like this is uh, thinking about the ability to do that in a consistent and systematic way, right? Uh, that is also efficient in the sense that it doesn't take forever or, or, or that you can really control and, uh, and use uh, systematically, right? So just to clarify a little bit more, how, how, how many years of data previously do you use and, and how many years out do you forecast out? Because a lot of people would say, if you're forecasting 100 and 200 years out, how do I even know if that's accurate, you know, 200 years later? Well, we don't, we don't know <laughs> because it doesn't happen. Yeah. But uh, no, but I mean, so, so I think that's a, that's a, that's a really important question. Um, so, you know, Data at this level of spatial disaggregation, the one that I'm talking about, say the one degree by one degree that we were mentioning before, so 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers in the equator, um, is not available for many years. So this is an effort that uh, North House did at, at Yale um, to, to collect all this local data, et cetera, and have it in a systematic way. And, you know, this level of disaggregation, they have four cross sections uh, starting in the 90s. And so, you know, that's the data that we have available unless you kind of bring in like a full data effort in trying to, you know, create more cross sections of that data. And so we haven't done that. And so that's the data that we have available to use. Um, and so that implies that we can use essentially 20 years of uh, to, and, and where that restriction is really binding, I mean, you can use more data for other phenomena, like for example, to think about, you, 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 you also mentioned fertility and the fact that, you know, there's there, people have children in this model and they can have, and depending on your income and the level of temperature, you have more or less children too. So, the, so, so, so we also have that type of uh, um, mechanism in the model. And so, so that, of course, you know, is an intergenerational mechanism. So there, you know, 20 years is nothing. So you wouldn't, you cannot really only use 20 years of data because you wouldn't be able to specify uh, those functions. So, so there we use a uh, much longer time series to try to match like UN predictions on uh, and, uh, and the evolution that they, uh, in their data, uh, on populations at the local level, et cetera. So, so there we use more data, but at the local level, you know, we use these 20, 20 years and essentially this process that I was describing before of inverting to get the amenities and the productivity, we can use, we can do that for the different cross sections. And so what that gives you is like a time, a panel, right? So, so some, 
So changes in productivity over time and changes in amenities over time, over this period. And then of course we have temperatures at the local level. And so that allows you to estimate like a panel regression where you use, you have local fixed effects, you have some local trends and, and, and you can capture the effect of um, temperature on these fundamentals, not on output, right? Which is the difference between this and that old literature that we were mentioning at the beginning, right? Uh, on these fundamentals for those uh, for those 20, 20, 20 years. And you can, you know, you get some some significant effects. So so there's some statistical power in the exercise, but um, but but there's also a lot of uncertainty. So by no means are we sure about the levels of that effect. And that's because of what you were in fair, uh, but because of what you were alluding to, which is that, you know, it's not, it, the, the time frame is not that long. And because, and, and so, you know, the amount of, the, the level of effects that we've seen in the economy is not that large. And so that implies that it's, you know, hard to estimate very precisely so far, right? And so, you know, as time goes by, we're gonna have more data. And so you can kind of progressively refine uh, this, type of, uh, this type of estimation to have a little bit more certainty about the level of the effect. Now, even though we're very uncertain about the level, right, of the, of the impact. So think about the impact is like a curve, right? Where for different temperatures in the world, right? you calculate what's what we call the semi-elasticity of temperature on productivity or on amenities. Namely, what's the effect of a one degree Celsius increase on amenities if you are in a region, if you're in the coldest region in the world, right? And then what if you're in, and so you do it by bins of temperature, and of course, that number changes depending on the level of temperature, right? Because it's very different to have a one degree increase in temperatures in Siberia where it's very cold. And so that's a good thing relative to, you know, in the middle of the Sahara where it's very warm. And so that's obviously a bad thing. So, uh, so, so that curve is kind of a declining curve, right? Depending on temperature. And so in the extremes, right? For very cold temperatures and very uh, warm temperatures, you do get kind of more power to estimate this uh, significantly. In the middle, when we're talking about what's exactly the optimal temperature, they, that's the part where we really don't know, right? So, but, but you do estimate some significant effects in details. And so, so what that gives you is, it gives you kind of a sense of what's gonna be the range of impacts in different parts of the world, but a lot of uncertainty about the level of those impacts. Uh, and so that's kind of the main issue of, uh, of estimating things over you know, a relatively short, uh, short, short panel. Now, there's another aspect of your question, which I think is very interesting, which is, well, to what extent, you know, what's the, can we really say something about what's gonna happen in 100 years or 200 years with models like this? I mean, are they, I mean, is this, is this exercise even worth doing given all the uncertainties that we have, et cetera? I mean, I think that's an, it's, a, it's a very valid question, right? Because I mean, at the end of the day, we're in very, in, investing all this time and effort on and, and resources on trying to, 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 to make this stick. And then, you know, if, if, if at the end of the day, we don't believe the results and we start by not believing the results kind of almost, uh, a priori, then uh, then what, I what are we doing, right? And so here's what I would have to say about that. When we're thinking about 100, 200, 300, 400 years down, right? Obviously, that's extremely uncertain. I mean, so, so, so we of course have to recognize uh, the uncertainty involved in that, right? Now, the question is, but we still need to assess put together what we know about the phenomenon and try to get a, a notion of the magnitude of what we're talking about. Because without that, it's very hard to commit real resources 
to address these issues, right? That is, if you don't, if we don't, if, if we don't say, well, this is the magnitude of the problem, right? Then we, how much are we willing to spend on it? I mean, right? I mean, how can we determine how much are we willing to spend on it? How, how much are we willing to sacrifice for it if we cannot have an assessment of the problem? So I think, you know, having an overall assessment of the magnitude of the problem is actually a crucial issue. And we need to, we need to know because, you know, the idea that this is somehow categorical, that we have to address it no matter what, right? And that we have to put whatever resources are available to deal with it is also false, right? We're not willing to sacrifice everything for it, clearly, right? And so, and so you know, at the end of the day, it's a cost-benefit analysis. We're going to sacrifice some resources to address this issue. Uh, and there's the issue is, how, you know, how much? How much are we going to sacrifice to do it, right? And so, uh, and so for that, in order to answer that question, we need to um, have better assessment models. Now, the question is how to, you know, there's different ways of doing that. One is to say, well, let's forget about models. Let's go forget about agents. Let's forget about all of that. Let's just try to look at some, do some sort of empirical extrapolation of the damages that we've seen so far or something like that, right? Now, the problem is, of course, that the data issue that we already talked about, you know, you're facing, you face that issue there too, right? First of all, right? I mean, the data that you have is the data that you have, right? And, and, and you know, when you're doing this like uh, empirical extrapolation, I mean, you're also applying a model. It's just that you don't know anything about that model. You're just imposing linearity or you're imposing a, a specific functional form on it, right? Now, it's mo I think it's much better to, to say, well, no, I know something about the structure of this economy. I know I have a lot of no accumulated knowledge about what how agents behave, what they do, how they trade, how they migrate, et cetera. Well, let's put that knowledge to use, right? If we, particularly if we want to make predictions 200 years down, exactly, that's exactly when doing just, you know, uh, empirical extrapolations is not good enough because those are likely going to be terrible 200 years down. And so let's put everything we know about this process into, into, um, into the ability to forecast. And I think under, you know, our understanding of the interactions between uh, among agents um, can help. Now at the more practical level, right? Here is one of the, of the things that you can do. You can test it. And here's the way you can test it. The way you can test it is because instead, instead of making predictions 100 years down, right? So in the future, you can think about, well, what if I take the model turn time in the other direction so so and go backwards rather than than forwards in time i can do that right i can turn time i can put a minus on time and, and make time uh, go the other way around in the model right and so now the model is going to have predictions on what should happen not not as a result of climate change because that effect was not that important but it's certainly going to tell me something about you know, what the model predicts in terms of migration flows and changes in population in different places and things like that, right? And so we've done um, many exercises like that. And, the, and, 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 and what I would argue is that the model has kind of a lot of predictive power. So, so here's, here's one, here's one uh, way to think about it, right? Like people move, but they don't move that much, right? So in levels, right? Um, the model, the model, of course, does great because you know the, it, 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 population counts are very persistent. Now, in changes, it's a much stricter test, right? Can you predict the changes in population in a particular point, say, fifty years uh, in the past or hundred years in the past? And now, if you think about that exercise, you cannot have as a benchmark the idea that the model is going to explain things perfectly. Because of course, you know, when you go 100 years to the past, you know, there's, there's a, a world war that is not part of the model, right? And so of course that, that matters, right? I mean, there's, that is, there's a lot of shocks and events that happen 
that are not the result of these fundamental economic forces that we're talking about, right? But 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 there's but these fundamental economic forces matter as well, and they explain, you know, depends on what decade you 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 do, etc. But they, you know, 40, 50 percent of the variation that you see, so the correlation between populations is uh, is relatively large in changes, and so that tells you that these fundamental forces have a lot of power to explain where people are, and so that's kind of an what's called an over-identification test of the model, right? Uh, to, to, to think about, uh, you know, how good the model is or is not. And so, we, you know, this fund, again, this fundamental for, it's, it's, it's hard to know exactly what the standard should be, right? Because again, there's all these shocks and, and how much of the variation you're gonna explain depends on the shocks that the economy experienced that you're not incorporating the model, right? So. It, so, so of course, like we said, we're you're not going to explain everything, but um, but there's definitely some real explanatory power in the model to explain those population counts. And so, in that sense, you know, we think that um, that kind of justifies the use of of this type of of framework to think about the future. That was just such a powerful uh, explanation, uh, Professor, because it feels like this a wonderful cross section into knowing the, the logic of an economist of how to think through those pro problems and uh, uh, ident identification, prediction, constructing counterfactuals and so on. So uh, highly, highly interesting. But I, I, I guess since we pr talked about the, the question of cost benefit analysis, and I think this is what all this about, you know, connecting climate science with economics, figuring out the cost. Uh, do you exert at some part your sort of own judgment, your own normative judgment or political judgment and say this should be the right level of assumptions we should we should construct or integrate into a model? This would be the ideal place we should get to by 2050, because it is very interesting for me to see that in your paper, you did talk about the welfare losses, welfare gains in different regions. You predict the, the certain catastrophes and gains for certain regions, but you don't say we need to do this by this year in order for this to happen. You, you, you don't make these kind of predictions that we often see in news headlines. Like if we don't reduce the temperature by this, it would happen like this. So I'm really curious to, to, to hear if that's what your takeaways are, are from this model and what kind of uh, normative or political or economic assumptions you built into your model uh, as you saw through it. Right, so, so I mean, I guess, you know, the ideal, in the, in the ideal world, I would do zero of that, right? I would be, I'm a scientist thinking about the, in, in a detached way, thinking about the behavior of agents and firms, trying to model that, incorporating this phenomenon and letting it play out and th think about what the, these effects are once I introduce all these kind of complex mechanisms into, into the model, right? And so, and then, the, the, what I can do is I can try out policies. I mean, one of the big advantages of introducing these uh, mi micro behavior or, or like the micro foundations to the model and the different adaptation mechanisms that we were talking about is that, um, that then when you do policy analysis, when I introduce a policy into the model, right? These agents are gonna, you know, react to it and are gonna adjust to it, and so I have, in some sense, a better policy evaluation. I can, I can see what's gonna happen as a result and how these agents are gonna react as a result of these policies. So one of the, so, 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 in some sense, the one of the key uses of these models is as, um, as a little toy economy, right? That we can like poke and do different things to, right? And see how it reacts. Uh, as a to test different types of uh, policies and mechanisms, etc. Right, and so you can do that. And the number of policies and the number of mechanisms that you can try out is very, very large. Right, so so you can test many sort of different policies. And so I, that's where I think the, the 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 judgment call comes a little bit more in, which is well, what are the policies that I'm going to try out? Right, uh, because in some sense the set is really big, and um, and I, and so I'm just gonna do some, right? I can I'm not gonna I cannot do all of them because the, the set of potential policies is uh, too big. Now, of course, you could ask, well, why don't you just 
solve for the optimal policy and tell me what the optimal policy is. And the answer, the short answer to that is I can't. I can't because I don't know how to do it. I mean, that, that problem is really complex problem. I don't know how to solve that problem. I have, we haven't cracked that problem. So I cannot give you what the actual optimal policy is, but what I can do is I can try different things out. I can put them in place and see what happens, right? Essentially. And so, and so I, I you know, so, so one example of that is carbon taxes, right? So carbon taxes, people talk all the time about carbon taxes and carbon taxes are, are uh, discussed uh, many times. I mean, you look, follow the, the discussions in the press, etc. They're always, uh, carbon taxes are, are, are discussed as, well, we all know that all economists agree that carbon taxes are the solution to this problem. But there's a bunch of political issues, et cetera. So at the end of the day, you know, we're now, you know, so, the, so one question is, is that right? I mean, do we all agree that this is the right, um, right policy or not, right? And so one of the things that you can do is you can try that out in the model. Now, there's, there's a mechanism that I think it's important when you think about carbon taxes, right? And you discuss carbon taxes. Obviously, the reason the reason uh, people say that carbon taxes are the solution to this problem, it's I mean it's a well-founded reason, which is, well, this is a global externality, like we said, right? And you know, one way to solve the global externality is by pricing carbon correctly, right? Because the key issue when you have an externality is that the social value of some action is different than the private value of that action, right? That's the key problem when you have an externality. And so what does policy, what, do, what, what, what does policy have to do is uh, close that gap, right? It has to close that gap between the social value and, um, and, um, and the private value. And so, you know, if you can do that, then you solve the problem. That's it, end of story, right? Now, the issue is of course that that, so that gap between the social value and the private value may vary depending on the location, may vary depending on the point in time where we are, uh, the elasticity of substitution between fossil fuels and uh, clean energy may also be changing over time. And so all of that is gonna make, yes, in principle, if we close that gap, we are done, but closing that gap may require like a policy that is so complex Right, that is, it may imply that we're changing these carbon taxes all the time, and we are adjusting them all, all the time, and and we it, it's very kind of for uh, information intensive, right? Now, there's another thing which you, you can say, well, yeah, maybe, but let's just get it about right on average, impose it, and we're gonna get most of the benefits, right? I mean, so you could you could use that logic, right? And so let's just be practical. Right, and so what? That's, for example, one of the things that you can try in the model. You can say, well, okay, let's impose a common flat carbon tax every, everywhere in the world, and you know who's, and then you can, well, how effective is it? First of all, in in curbing uh, carbon emissions and stopping uh, global warming, and then you know who's affected, who pay, I mean, you know who's um, who's going to benefit, who's going to be hurt by it, etc. And, uh, and now one mechanism that is really important when you think about policy and when you think about carbon taxes in particular is, um, is the following is, think about fossil fuels. So we're using fossil fuels, right? The more fun, and, and there's this other alternative energy, which is this clean energy, right? That is being produced and it's, it's, it's increasingly you know, we can produce it better and more efficiently, et cetera. And so that means that the price of clean energy is kind of falling relative to fossil fuels to some, or we've seen some trend in that. But uh, one of the things that happens with fossil fuels is like the more you consume them, right? The, the, in some sense, the more costly it is to extract them in relative terms. So relative to clean energy, right? So the costs are gonna go up and so it's like, you know, you have to dig deeper for the coal or for the oil, right? Or go to, you know, deeper waters to, to get, the, get the oil. And so it becomes more and more costly the more you use it. And so what that creates is that if I put a carbon tax, you consume less, 
uh, carbon, right? But if you consume less carbon, that means that you know when you consume it, you don't have to dig as deep because you haven't consumed that much, right? And so that means that the price hasn't increased that much. So, so there's this effect that is kind of going against you because the less you consume, the less the price increases. And so that's kind of eliminating, in some sense, part of that, uh, that tax that you're imposing. So it's kind of going against you in some sense. And so what does that mean? It means that uh, at the end of the day, you are essentially delaying, delaying the, the consumption of carbon using with the carbon tax rather than the, reducing the total use over you know, the, the next uh, three or four centuries. And so that means you're, you're, you're shifting that curve, you're shifting the, the emissions of carbon uh, so that you are doing it later. And that of course reduces temperatures, so certainly in the short run. Uh, and so what the way we say it is like it flattens the temperature curve, right? So with like an COVID. analogy, I guess, with the COVID uh, crisis, yeah. right? It's like it flattens the curve by um, by now flattening the curve is useful, right? Particularly, uh, same as with uh, infections, if there's a vaccine coming, if there's a solution to the problem that is coming at some point, so you know, carbon emissions after a particular point in time don't matter that much because we have some abatement technology or some uh, geoengineering process that allows us to take care of the carbon in the atmosphere. And so that, um, so if that, if something like that uh, is forthcoming, then of course delaying is very useful. But otherwise, you know, it's really a trade-off between. Uh, current generations versus future generations. And so at the end of the day, what one of the things that comes out very clearly is, you know, this is an intergenerational problem. I mean, this is obviously not nothing new, but I mean, but, but it also comes out in the context of what we're doing, which is, you know, relatively high cost of imposing, say, Sweden level carbon taxes everywhere in the world. I mean, just to be concrete, right? Uh, if you do that, um, you know, the, the, the world economy, I mean, those taxes are, are going to be felt by the, the world economy. And so you're going to produce less output for sure. Now, of course, in the long run, the, they, they create benefits. They, you have less, less uh, carbon emissions. Um, you shift that curve, as we said, that implies lower temperatures, which is good for many regions. And so those regions, productivity is going to be higher. There's going to be more investments, et cetera. So all that process kicks in. And so, you know, in the future, you're going to get benefits of that. But then, you know, this trade-off between current generations and future generations becomes crucial, right? And how you value that becomes crucial. So you were asking me, well, where are your, you know, value judgments coming in when you do this type of analysis, just to come back to your question? Well, you know, uh, one there's there's two that are very important. I mean, and and we try not to really get into that, but I mean, our, but 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 these two two issues are very very important when you think about these policies and and think about evaluating these policies, right? So I can come with my model and tell you this is going this is the outcome. This is how this is going to affect the different generations. But then you know, society has to come and say, well, do we want to do this, right? Do we want to do this or not, given that this is going to be the outcomes? I mean, and then there's, of course, uncertainty, everything that we talked about, but suppose we actually know that this is going to be the outcome, right? Well, society has to come and say, well, is this, is this something that we want to do, right? Is this, does this make sense as a uh, as a as a policy, given that we're going to get this outcome, and that of course involves, as you know, as many people in this literature have uh, have remarked before, uh, as a, a view on how we um, weight the impact on different generations. So how we whether we weigh the impact on us more than the impact of future generations, taking into account also the fact that future generations are going to be very likely richer than us, right? Because the economy in general grows over time, 
right? And so, and productivity has grown over time. So if those, and, and you know, in this type of models, they, they predict also that, you know, the economy is gonna be growing in terms of income per capita over time. And so, and so what that tells you is, well, those people are gonna be richer, right? But, uh, but, you know, we also care a little bit less uh, about them than about ourselves. I guess we're selfish as, uh, as, as uh, reflected by the fact that in most places, interest rates are positive, <laughs> right? And, and, so, and so, what, so what does that mean? It means that, you know, if the growth and so you know the, the the relationship between the growth rate and the interest rates become becomes key, right? So if that is if those two things are essentially the same, that means that we're evaluating everyone the same. So so we're giving the same weight to everyone. If that number is a little bit so if the growth rate is a little bit smaller than than the interest rate, that means that we're discounting the future a little bit, and so we care more. And it turns out that at least in our calculations. You know the, the 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 overall present discounted value of this, right? Depends a lot on how you do that um, that weighting. Where, how do how do you do that discounting? So that's a very important. So that's and so what what view you take on that on on what you think society would want to do conditional on this outcome, right? It's very important in whether this is a good policy or not, whether you actually want to put it in place or not. The other important issue in terms of value judgments, which again, society has to do, I don't want to do as an economist, I don't have the mechanism, I don't have the tools to, to do it myself on, or do it with any sort of authority myself, right? I can give you the outcomes, but I cannot give you that evaluation, right? Is a lot of these policies, we talked about fertility, right? And the fact that this fertility is also a kind of, or really natality, which is like fertility minus, um, minus uh, death rates, right? So changes in population as a result of fertility and deaths in a, in a given location, that, those, that, that depends also on the level of income and depends on the level of uh, temperature. Why? You know, this is like the, the, the traditional Beckerian view that is that as people become richer, you know, well, I mean, in, very much in the data, of course, uh, that as people become richer, uh, they invest more in their children, right? And so, and so, but they have less, less of them. So, they, so, so, so there's like a quantity quality trade-off where they, um, you know, uh, and so, and so in, in general, richer societies, uh, go through, uh, or societies go through a demographic transition as they get richer, right? Where people have less children, um, right? And so, so that's kind of in the in the in the model uh, as well. And there's also effects of temperature, mostly on mortality. And you know, Michael Greenstone and co-authors have estimated what those effects are that we kind of bring into 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 the model. But but but. Because you have these effects on, on natality, right? That means that policy is also gonna affect the number of people in the world in the future, right? Because you know, if you make some areas poorer, they're gonna have more children, or right, or or if you make the whole world richer, they're gonna have less children, right? And so, and so you're gonna you're affecting. The total num the total population in the future, and so the, the question then is, well, is that a good thing? I mean, how do you how do you value a world, a future world that has more or less people? Right, it's not an obvious question, right? Because obviously, if I just value you know like welfare, which is like a per person measure, right, then um, I don't care in principle. I mean, that measure is not affected by the, 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 the counts, population counts. But at the same time, there's, you know, one can make a reasonable argument that, you know, we should, you know, having more people. Yeah. <laughs> is, maybe is a, a good thing, right? So, society or something. So yeah. this is obviously like a very, you know, essential philosophical problem that, that, that no, by no means 
uh, is being solved in any sort of way by our work. But it's there are things that you know when we look at these outcomes that 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 we're discussing, you know, become very salient and very relevant to evaluate these policies. You cannot really evaluate these policies without taking a stand on this tip, on, on how you rank uh, and, different and allocations importance. depending yeah. on this, right? And, yeah. and, and, the rea- and the reality is that when people advocate particular policies, they are implicitly, most of the time, sometimes explicitly, mostly implicitly, taking a stand on a particular form of valuation, uh, both in terms of the discount factor and in terms of how you value more versus less people in the future. And so that's, I think, a hard problem. And it's hard to not um, n- to avoid it, right? Because at the end of the day, like I said, you are taking an implicit stand on it anyway. And the final, I guess, point in terms of value is, is of course the inequality, right? So one of the things that, that is uh, sup- that is highlighted by the work that we've done uh, is how unequal are the impact of this phenomenon, climate change in particular, but I mean, many aspects of uh, global warming in particular, but many aspects of climate change, how, how unequal is the effect across locations and therefore across uh, people? Right. So, and uh, and again, you know, how do how do we make decisions about that? Right. Is this and and, and you know to make to make things a little bit even worse is the places that are the worst impacted by this are the places that are the poorest. Right. The global south. So the global America. south. The you know is so in particular Africa, South America, you know, parts of India, parts of China and uh, Southeast Asia. So that part of the world is the one that is the most affected. And so, and is the poorest today. And so that that implies that, you know, you are really affecting the, the most vulnerable people in the world and the richest part of the of the of the world, you know, the U.S., uh, Europe, Japan, it's all in a latitude, right, in a, in a range of latitudes that is right in the cusp of, yeah. you know, the age, the places that are gonna lose and the places that are gonna win as yeah. a result of that. And so, you know, at the end of the day, the impact there is kind of relatively uh, small, or at least, you know, this is the prediction. Of course, like we said, there's a range of uh, outcomes and there's a lot of uncertainty about it in terms of levels. But, you know, but for sure, they're going to be affected a lot less than these other parts of these poorer parts of the world. And so when you think about global solutions is, well, you know, if you let the countries that are going to be the, not really impacted by this. Lead the pack in terms of finding a solution. Well, don't be super surprised <laughs> that you don't reach it. I mean, and and, yeah. I, and I mean that seems a little cynic, right? I mean, uh, cynical. I and and it is, of course. I mean, there's obviously lots of people in Europe, the United States, Japan, and these places that want seriously to solve this issue and that care a lot about. You know outcomes in other places, etc. And so I should I shouldn't be as cynical as that. But but there is a but obviously but but there is also but for sure there's a geopolitical problem here that depends on the distribution because uh, countries and country governments care more in general about the outcomes for their own economies than for the world as a whole. And I think you know they've been, they've been elected to do that, and so you know it makes sense that. Uh, that they, they they do so to some extent, and so in that sense, uh, you know, the the collective action problem is really really complicated by the by this inequality, right? Apart from the fact that it's so unfair, because a lot of these countries are not really historically the big polluters in the world. So so yeah, but they're you know 
getting more most of most of the effects. And so, uh, you know, that how to value that uh, again, how to value the the, the impact on that um, inequality, kind of uh, the, that worsening of inequality in the world is another important aspect in evaluating these policies and evaluating, you know, the effects of climate change. Uh, Professor Rossi Heinsberg, I, I uh, can't imagine that so much time has already passed by as we uh, really only got the chance to talk through one of your uh, fascinating papers. But perhaps, I guess, to, to gradually tie back to the beginning when we talked about spatial economics, uh, maybe just to situate back a little bit and, and th think again about the concepts such as we talked about uh, uncertainty and spatial economics. And, and you mentioned at the beginning that sp spatial economics, and, and I've listened to other interviews you've done, you, you've talked about how it cares about the distribution of expectations and other agents expectations of what could happen in the future because that would in turn influence their decisions and and the the location dimension really plays a part in spatial economics and that's what distinguishes it from traditional kind of macro models so uh, I, I guess my question would be as we think about uncertainty as we think about uh, you know quote unquote dynamic programming going forward Many have critiqued that ec economists today, especially in, in, in financial economics, that we're not doing dynamic, dynamic pro programming. We're not thinking enough about the, the, the underlying distribution that is often shifting and unknown. So I guess the, the question, a very broad question and very generic question to, to you would be, as, as you uh, do more research in spatial economics, as you lead the field forward, uh, how do you think about issues like uncertainty, distributions of probabilities when it comes to uh, different regions interacting with each other. I, I guess, or to, or to phrase it differently, what, what goes on in your mind every day as you try to map all these different things together? Yeah, um, so I think, I think incorporating, I mean, I think there's two key agendas in this literature. Uh, one is to incorporate risk and the implications of risk, both at the local level, but also at the more regional or country level into this analysis and think about these agents as internalizing this risk to different extents as you were describing and uh, reacting accordingly. Um, right now, what we can do is more limited than that. What we can do is look at shocks that were unexpected, right? and trace their impact, but they, they have to be unexpected, right? So, or we can look at perfect foresight outcomes where we know things are, or where people in the model know that things are happening, but, um, but they, um, so they, they fully anticipate them, right? But, uh, but it's much harder to think about, you know, partial information or kind of distribution assumptions of, of potential outcomes and preemptive reaction to some of that uh, future uncertainty. And so uh, that and, and the, the, the asset valuation implications that that has at the, at the local level is, uh, is it's kind of an open agenda. And it's an important agenda also because of course land which is kind of the, the, the spatial asset by excellence, right? Is, uh, is of course the value of land uh, it captures all of that uncertainty in some sense. That, that is the key asset that is capturing kind of the local, uh, the, the, the value of a particular geography, the value of a particular location is, is embedded in the value of land and through the value of land on, um, you know, those future kind of the future value also of that land, right? And because land is in some sense permanent, right? Whatever the valuation of that location is, you know, incorporates the full future evolution of the importance of that location relative to all these other locations in the world. So that's a very complex problem because of that. Um, and so, you know, making progress on how to address it is relevant in, and in particular, for example, when you think about valuation of land in, in places that are, you know, subject to uh, flooding and things like that, um, and why people 
are or are not moving away and kind of what's the role of the government in ensuring, for example, uh, against flooding and, and, and is that the reason why some of these prices are not being are not incorporating what we see as obvious risks from those locations, etc. So all that problem in some sense incorporates, uh, it, it's a problem that you would need to tackle by incorporating this type of uh, risk in these models. And the other big dimension that I'm, uh, just to, to, to finish the answer, the other big dimension I think is political, right? The, 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 the political economy aspects of loca localities and the choices that they're making, the political choices that they're making depending on the local effects of particular phenomena and how that kind of goes into political decisions that then, you know, lead to potential big changes in policy through the political system. And so that's, a, but, but that are generated by local effects also by, they are generated by the fact that, you know, particular locations are, uh, are unequally affected by certain phenomena. And I mean, uh, the classic example of that is the decline in manufacturing, right? So the decline in manufacturing happened in particular places or the rise of China uh, as, a, as a world trade partner, right? Uh, that affected particular places that had uh, specialized in manufacturing. And there was a lot of discontent in those places that then le has led to, you know, particular political outcomes and reactions, for example, against the trade as a result of that. So, uh, so incorporating that process, I think it's also uh, quite relevant. Uh, we only have a few minutes left. I think maybe it would be nice to also quickly touch on your, your career, your time at Princeton and also your next step forward because uh, you announced uh, earlier this, this year in February that after 16 years at Princeton, you're soon moving to, to your Chicago. So uh, may, maybe this would also be a good opportunity to, to quickly recap, I guess, your time here and, and uh, what you got for the future. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, yes, thank you. So, you know, let, let me, I guess for the young listeners that want to know about like a career in academia or at least in economics is I was, uh, I was, I grew up in Mexico City and uh, came to the United States to, to study, to do a PhD in economics uh, at the University of Chicago. And so, you know, that was my first contact with, uh, with the U.S. and the U.S. Uh, academia and uh, economics kind of at that level. I had studied uh, economics and math and statistics in, in, in Mexico um, for my undergrad. And, uh, and, you know, I thought this was the most fantastic place in the world in the sense that I think academia in the United States is just such a wonderful island in the world, right? And it's such a fantastic asset for the US economy and, the, and, and, and for the world really, is this, this bubble in, full of resources where individuals can spend their life um, thinking, uh, without any sort of interference or, or political influence or anything, right? That where you can really use your time to think about the problems that you think are important. And the only thing that you have to do in order to earn this, right, is um, be productive in terms of doing your research, uh, according to certain standards. And so I, th I think this is just a fantastic uh, community and a fantastic uh, asset, like I said, all this, this system of universities. And so I studied there, then I went to Stanford for a few years and as an assistant professor. Then, uh, and then from there I came to Princeton. And so the rest of my career so far has been uh, at Princeton. And Princeton, I came to Princeton because Princeton has been an absolute leader in and the field of international trade for many, many years. Uh, it has a wonderful center, which is the international economic section, which uh, is you know, one of the centers of uh, 
activity on international trade in the world and has been for many years and everyone visits and create and it has some of the main events in the field etc and so this has been really kind of a, a fantastic place to grow um, and 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 do my work and so princeton i tremendously grateful to princeton because princeton has created this this environment where that is really ideal to do this now um so then I guess the question is, well, but then why are you leaving? Well, uh, you know, because, because, because life is change, right? Because life is change and you have to keep um, trying different things and you have to, uh, you know, go to different places and conquer different worlds. And in that sense, you know, change, change is good and bringing the type of ideas and the type of uh, work that I've done to a different environment has its challenges, but it also has its benefits. And so, uh, you know, it's not that it's better, it's not that it's worse, it's simply different. And there's value in that difference and in taking advantage of that difference. And so, you know, in that sense, we thought it was time for a change. And, uh, you know, we also like the city. That's absolutely beautifully put. Uh, I think uh, when you announced that a lot of the graduate students I know at Princeton was, was uh, saying uh, the huge loss for, for Princeton, obviously, because you're a leader in the field and, and uh, just a great delight to be your student. So I, I think it's a loss for, for Princeton and a gain for Chicago, but also uh, congratulations on, on the move and on the, the next step of change. It, it sounds very exciting, obviously. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and I guess to, to last question in the tradition of our podcast, the name of our show is Policy Punchline. So maybe the last question would, would be, what would your punchline be for this show? I, I mean, to, to be honest, this is really the first time that I've done an interview for 90 minutes and we really only concentrated on one paper, or one topic. I, I know we really thought about we'd go through so many other, but you're also so prolific. But but this uh, this paper, I feel like it is really uh, a spotlight and that really brings things together. So what, what would a punchline be for, for today? I think, I think the punchline for today is when you think about the world and when you think about the effects of any phenomenon in the world, think about how it affects individuals. Never think about outcomes directly. Think about how it affects individual actors firms, people, and then try to think about how that leads to those aggregate outcomes. How can you group that together? Because only if you do that, do you have any sort of chance of getting it right. That's so powerful. Wow. I, I feel like that is also a major contribution that your work, your career, and spatial economics have been trying to do, which is not to look at uh, just extrapolating from aggregate disturbances or, or aggregate changes, but rather studying the aggregate, aggregate implications from disaggregated sources of impacts and implications. And, and that's really uh, the nuance there, which is really powerful. Okay, so thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank and you so much. It was, for has been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much for being on the show. And, and, and uh, obviously it's just been great to, to uh, know you and uh, be able to do this interview with you. So that was my conversation with Professor Rossi Hansberg. Uh, he is the Theodore A. Wells Professor at Princeton University and will soon join the University of Chicago's Economics Department as the Glenn A. Lloyd Distinguished Service Professor. You may follow him on Twitter. Uh, just Google his name, Esteban Rossi Hansberg. Uh, his Twitter handle is Hansberg Rossi. Uh, you can also go to his website, rossihansberg.com to follow his research, follow his remarks. There's some truly fascinating research being done by he and his co-authors and his team. Um, thank you so much for following us today. You may rate and review us on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud. Find us on any preferred platform that, that you listen to podcasts or watch podcasts. And follow us on policypunchline.com. Thank you so much for your support. We'll see you next time. You've been listening to Policy Punchline, a podcast generously supported by the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance at Princeton University.
We would also like to encourage you to follow other podcasts produced by Princeton University, such as Politics and Polls by the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. Policy Punchline is intended to be informational only and does not reflect nor represent the views of Princeton University or the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance. For more information on subscription, donation, volunteering, or contact, please visit policypunchline.com. Thank you again for listening.